have been so excited to have brought this study on the uh, Beatitudes, and I'm a little sad that we draw to close now the study on the Beatitudes, but I will tell you there are several other uh, sermons in the work along the way, and uh, prayerfully I will be able to present those to you over the next uh, coming weeks. What we have described in the last, oh, six to eight weeks is a process, a process that begins by emptying yourself of all of your worldly desires, of all of your self, if you will. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those that have poured out their spirit and have exposed themselves empty before Christ. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You will see an attitude that a someone wanting to make their the life more Christian or devote their lives more toward Christ. You will see the attitude and you will see the reward that they receive, the beatitude, if you will, the blessing that they receive in doing so. We have poured out our spirit. We have mourned because we stand sinful and naked and empty before our Lord. We are humbled by that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For they shall be comforted and they shall inherit the earth. Then we see a turning point in someone who has exposed their lives, who have emptied themselves before God. Blessed are those who now hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. For they shall be filled. Filled with what? The kind and the good and the righteousness that they seek. And then we start filling our lives and we complete the process. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And we see our reward building and building and building until it seems that we are met with a paradox. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, the righteousness that they've sought, the righteousness that they've provided, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now wait just a minute, that's the same blessing that I was promised in the start, but do you understand the fulfillment of the start, the full circle, if you will? I've poured out my spirit, now there is promised to me a kingdom of in he of heaven. Now, blessed are those who are persecuted for doing these things that they have devoted their, their lives toward, for theirs is, and there's your emphasis, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you, Jesus says, when they revile and they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for my sake. And I want you to remember that if you take nothing else with you today. For my sake. Why are we doing this? For our own honor and glory? For our own edification? For our own uplifting? For aren't I so wonderful to endure all of this? No. None of that whatsoever. We do what we do as Christians, as followers of Christ, because we follow Christ. And we do things for His sake, in His name, as He would have us do them. You see, when He is the head and we are His body, we are the hands and the feet that move through this world and touch lives and change souls for Christ. We are His workmen and we are His workmanship all in the same. You will be falsely accused for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Not just the kingdom of heaven that you're, that you're promised, but your reward in heaven is great. For they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, the book of Luke, chapter 6 and verse 23, 
uh, reiterates the Beatitudes. And when it comes to blessed are you who are persecuted, he says rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Be excited that you are being persecuted in the name of Christ. In your Bibles, in the book of 2 Timothy, in chapter 3 and verse 12, we have a process here that Paul is telling the uh, young preacher, Timothy, you know, there's hard times coming, son, and, and it's going to be hard to be a Christian where you're at. And he's getting ready to say, but you know, you stay in the Scriptures because all Scripture is by inspiration of God and is profitable for the, uh, for the Son of God. Uh, for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But if you look in verse 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, and here it is, if you ever want the promise, here is the promise. Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Want to know why things are tough for Christians? Want to know why the world picks on Christians? Want to know why you're persecuted and Christians have been persecuted since the foundations of the time? It is the promise of God. It is the promise of God. But why persecution? For my namesake or for my sake. Matthew chapter 10 Verses 16 and 18, Jesus tells his uh, disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep among the wolves. I want you to picture the idea of a shepherd releasing his sheep out of the sheepfold, out of the protection of the gate, into the pasture land where you're to graze, where you're to grow, where you're to uh, nurture. And, a man, and around you are rabid, foaming at the mouth, red-eyed wolves ready to tear you to pieces. He says, therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He says, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in the synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings. Now look at this. For my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Just a few verses down, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And you will be hated, the Lord says to his disciples, all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Now, we, we have those friends of ours who say all you have to do is uh, recant some prayer or, or say something or believe only and you will be saved. We have others who say, well, yes, there's a process where you have to be repent. And then others who will add a confession and then, of course, baptism for the remission of sins. And, and to what point receives a salvation? Well, Jesus adds to that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. He who endures to the end will be saved. What happens if you do not endure to the end? Is there <coughs> salvation for you? Or have you forsook the blessings that were promised to you in Matthew chapter 5? Matthew 16 verses 24 through 27 Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What I've just told you right there, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, is the entire of the Beatitudes in one phrase. The entire of Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 can be stated in one simple phrase. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole of the world and loses his own soul? 
And number two, and what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, if you continue through the verses, and, and they're so numerous to list, and time does not permit, Matthew 19, 29, Matthew 24, 9, Mark 8, 35, Mark 9, 41, Mark 10, 29, Mark 13 and 13, Luke 6, 22 and 23, Luke 9, 24, Luke 18, 29, Luke 21, 17, all words from the Lord that says, you will suffer persecution for my namesake. It is a promise. It is a taking up of your cross. It is a suffering of persecution. And what are our actions when they do persecute us? Take up a stick and swing back, right? Retaliate with revenge. No. Get even. Our attitude of the beatitude, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Excuse me, Lord. Why? why? Why would I do that? What gain is there for me if I allow someone to persecute me and then I pray for them and I bless them and I do good to them? There is a book that was written in the early 1900s and uh, for those techie types, you can, you can obtain a free PDF of this on, online. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Many Bible stores, I know h and and I know Family Christian both have Fox's Book of Martyrs. It is a historical account of those who have given their life for the cause of Christ. Some in pretty grand, gross detail, if you will especially under the persecutions of Nero and of Tiberius, um, Diocletian, and Domitian. It, it, it recalls Stephen, um, James, the brother of John, being pierced with a sword by Herod just to make the people happy. It recalls Stephen being stoned to death in the streets outside of the temple just to shut him up. It recalls each and every one of the apostles dying for the cause of Christ. It tells the account of the young preacher Timothy, whom we all love and hold dear because Timothy helped and Timothy was requested of Paul. In Fox's Book of Martyrs, Timothy is the preacher in Ephesus and there's a group of pagans going through having some kind of pagan parade on the Lord's Day. He goes out and he tries to stop them and they club Timothy to death on the streets. It tells of Paul being beheaded under Nero for the cause of Christ. It tells of Peter being crucified, nailed to a cross for Christ's sakes. And worse as we go on to the great Christian persecutions of the first century, uh, people torn to shreds, eaten alive by animals, set on a stake and uh, covered with pitch and lit up to light the emperor's garden at night. All Christians who the only thing they were guilty of was one not worshiping the emperor, the Caesar, and two proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. What horrors they suffered. And they did not give up the name of Christ or renounce the name of Christ. Under the emperor's Vespian, there was a clause added to the torture of Christians. Christians could not just say, okay, okay, I'll quit preaching Jesus. 
they had to renounce Jesus to not receive persecution by the Romans. And many just couldn't do that. And here's what I say to that. Thank God for those men and women who stood firm, who denied self, who took up the cross and followed Him. Because of them, I have this. And because of them, I have a hope of heaven. Because of them, I had the opportunity to have the gospel preached to me. And my soul will be saved because of the efforts of the body of Christ this day and 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul knew that we would suffer persecution. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. My grace is sufficient for you, Jesus tells Paul. When? When Paul is begging him to relieve him of an infirmity of the flesh. Paul calls it a thorn in his flesh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse uh, 8 or 7, I'm sorry. He says, My strength is made perfect in your weakness. The Lord's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmity, says Paul, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, when I am weak, Paul says, he is strong. And we sing that to our children, yes? Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The apostles were persecuted. If you recall Acts chapter 5, verses 40 and uh, 42, or 43 42, Peter and John were beaten by the Jewish council, were, were demanded that they never preach in the name of Jesus Christ again. They counted it honor to suffer shame for his name. And it says in verse 42, And then daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease in teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Paul in Acts chapter 9 verses 15 through 16 was to go to Jerusalem where he was to suffer shame and die. The Ephesian church begged him not to go and he said, Go, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and before kings and before the children of Israel. For I will show him, the Lord says, how many things he will suffer for my name's sake. And in Acts chapter 21, he understood it. He says, Paul says, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not only to be found, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if that be the case. <coughs> In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, and verses 13 through chapter 4, and verses 19, Peter spends a great deal of his first epistle telling us we must suffer for the cause of Christ. We must suffer for the cause of Christ. He says in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. Peter says, for our beatitude, for our blessings, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17, for it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with that same mind. He says, For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he is no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. He continues in chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, look what he says. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, 
Blessed are you for the Spirit of God and of God rests upon you. Is Peter not recounting what the Lord said at the beginning of his ministry? Blessed are you for who are persecuted for my name's sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Peter is telling you at the end of his public ministry, at the end of Peter's life on this earth, he says, suffer and consider it worthy. He says, for it is better to do suffer doing good than for doing evil. And he says, and if you are reproached, blessed are you for the Spirit of God and of God rests upon you. And Peter says in verse 16 of the same chapter, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. The funny thing is, is that none of this is new. None of this is new. Not even to the apostles and to the disciples at the time of Christ. They knew that when Messiah come, they were going to suffer for His namesake. It was spoken to them in the Psalms. Psalm 44, 22. You don't have to look that up because it's retold to you in Romans chapter 8. Paul's great Discourse on sermons. Look at Rome, our suffering. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things? And I love this. This is a go-to verse. If God be for us, then who is against us? He says, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him who also freely gives us all things... Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, it is also and has also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes an intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness? Peril or sword, as it is written. Here is Psalm 44, 22. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep before the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors. Through Him who loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other thing created shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul would know about it. How many times in his epistles did he say, I am prisoner of the Lord, <laughs> delivering his message through chains and through prison bars. We suffer on His behalf. We're cast down, but we're not conquered. The Lord directed this to us. The things that would lead to our earthly persecution and promises that He will take care of us. And it all begins with Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. Let me ask you, are you in? Are you among the persecuted? Are you among the suffering? Are you among the, the elect that count it worthy to suffer shame for His namesake? If not, there's a great and glorious Thing waiting for you. Persecution of this world, but glory and riches in the next. And a life eternal and a kingdom in heaven and a great reward for all who suffer for His name's sake. In the seconds we have left, consider the church of uh, Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, 
And it says they will receive persecution on this earth. They will receive condemnation on this earth. And in their persecution, they will be faced by Satan. They will be bound in prison. Revelation 2 verse 10, Remain faithful unto death. And there is laid aside for you a crown of righteousness. It is the same crown of righteousness that Paul talks about in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. It is the same crown of righteousness that Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 4. It is the crown of righteousness laid up for you if you endure to the end. And not just you, to all according to Paul who have loved his appearing. Hear those words and believe them. Repent of your sins, confess his name, and be baptized for the remission of your sin. Of your sins, take on his cross. Deny yourself and follow him. If you have needs to obey the gospel, if you have needs to return to the truth, whatever your needs, why won't you come forth as together we stand and as we sing?